This is a perfect combination of a delicately formed last aesthetic and a really durable uppers leather and construction. This is the Parkhurst stitch down version of the Allen Plain Toe Boot on the Dressy 618 Last using Charles F. Stead's Shrunken Rambler Leather. G'day, how you going? Welcome back to my Bootlosophy channel and if you're new, my name is Tech. I live and work in the Perth region in Western Australia and I acknowledge the elders past and present of the Wajuk people who are the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways where I live. This is the Parkhurst Allen Plain Toe Boot. This version is made in uh, Portugal and as you can see is built on Parkhurst's new 618 Last uh, with quite a pointed arm and toe, but I'll talk more about that soon. Andrew has been building his boots in Spain for some time now, but this year he was introduced to a Portuguese factory specialising in stitch down construction. This line was first introduced as an experiment last year, and you can see the tryout boots that I had up here. This year, Andrew, the owner of Parkhurst, released a whole line of this boot in various uppers, including veg tans from Tempesti in Italy, uh, waxed flesh from US tannery Horween, and Kudu, Mohawk and Rambler from Charles F. Stead in England. This is obviously a service boot pattern that Parkhurst is famous for, despite also making uh, derby shoes, chuckers, mock toe boots and Chelsea boots. I've put a link to Parkhurst's website down in the description area below. And if you want to know more about the brand, what better way than to dive into how the owner thinks? Go and see my interview with Andrew Savisco up here. This is a plain toe service boot built on a last that's the uh, foot shaped mold that's designed to be uh, quite sleek in profile in this case. Uh, it's comfortable in the middle and it's locked in at the heel. It's roughly six inches high at the shaft, a very simple pattern used of the vamp and the tongue, two quarter pieces and a one piece backstay. The design to me is delicate in its lines and wouldn't fail a dressy boot. But where Parker steps out is in putting rugged uppers on this design and then uh, using the stitch down method of construction, making it a highly tough and durable boot. I am on record as saying that if you don't want to pay nearly a thousand dollars for a Weiberg in their interesting uppers, get these. They have everything you desire in a Weiberg except for history. The 618 last is a combination of Parkhurst's first original last, the 18, which was very dressy and had a, a pointy arm and toe box. Criticism that it received at the time, despite the looks everyone liked, was that there perhaps wasn't enough room in the toes. Parkhurst later replaced it with the 602 last. It was a combination last that locked in the heel and waist and opened out at the ball of the foot and then rounded into a round almond toe. Uh, the nicest iteration of it, I think, is the 602 Spruce Kudu, which you can see up here. This 618 is a perfect combination of the two, allowing a dressy forefoot, but also providing more room uh, through extra length and keeping the combination of narrow rear and wide, nearly doubly width at the ball of the feet. Putting a beautifully tanned Rambler leather on it in a dark reddish purplish brown color gives it completely different vibes from the dressier versions that you can get with the Tempesti smooth grain veg tans. Rambler is tanned by the famous Charles F. Stead tannery in Leeds in the UK. Stead's been around since the 1890s and is famous for tanning probably the world's best suede. Rambler is actually a shrunken suede. Now during the tanning, suede is further treated by being tumbled in heat and waxes, shrinking it by up to a third. Naturally, this makes it a, a firmer uh, uh, than untreated suede. Imagine the looser fibers of suede being compressed by a third, creating a, quite a tight fiber structure, a tight grain structure on the surface. The treatment means that Rambler is more water resistant, even before uh, further adding the oils and waxes, and the treatment reveals all the under the surface scars and, and veining. According to leather suppliers, the tannery row, Rambler is then finished on the flesh side, a kind of rough outside to the suede, and it includes 
hand antiquing and waxes to create this marbling effect. Now, I haven't worn these very much since I bought them, but you can already see the potential kind of shifting patina on these boots, uh, especially where I've stressed it as it stretches at the ball of my uh, foot and the uh, rolling on the vamp that's beginning to show. This means that it is a pair of casual boots, uh, anywhere from rugged to smart casual. So the color and texture of the uppers totally suit a simple denim on denim approach and having a dressier toe box, uh, quite a slimmer cut denim like on these Gustin Selvage jeans paired with a standard denim shirt. The difference in color of the denim gets away from standard Canadian tuxedo, I think. Tell me what you think. You can also wear these with work pants like this pair of Huckberry's proof double knee work pants. As long as you keep the colors neutral or earthy, they go well with the reddish purples under this brown. A simple t-shirt and a chore coat also works. So does a work shirt, not for work mine because these are not work boots, but for a relaxed social occasion out with friends or at a barbecue. Now, while not business in a professional office casual, you can wear them smartly casual for a very casual creative office or for parties on summer lawns and even outdoor weddings if you pair them with a smart pair of these R.M. Williams Bucks in Colored Ramco jeans and a crisp white shirt and a classic navy blazer. In a hot summer, swap out the white shirt for a smart, bright colored polo shirt that pops with the purple in the Rambler leather. I have left the links to some of what I'm wearing down in the description below, and some are affiliate links, which means I get a small commission if you buy from those links. So if you're already thinking of buying, you can help out my channel by buying uh, from those links. You can, of course, also help me out by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons below. Okay, let's now run through the construction of these boots. Now, I've been doing these videos for nearly three years and I've pumped out nearly 500 videos. When I think back, it astounds me, honestly, uh, but I bring this up because in every uh, review video that I, I go into, uh, I go into details of the construction of the boots. Some people say to me, oh, don't be so repetitive, but I'm not so arrogant as to think that you, the viewer, has seen every one of my videos. So I go through construction details primarily because if you're new here or you're new to heritage boots generally, you may not know what the difference is between Goodyear welted construction, say, and stitch down construction, and I shouldn't presume that you do. If you've heard it all before, like my lower viewers, you can, of course, skip ahead. But even so, I do try to focus on maybe something new each time and particularly about the boots being reviewed. Anyway, let's look at the construction of these boots uh, starting from the bottom. Literally at the bottom, the outsole is a proprietary rubber commando lugged outsole. Parkhurst have these made, uh, I still have the label, <laughs> in, they have these made in nearby Spanish factories, not just to save a few cents, mind you, because it does allow Andrew uh, to adjust the pattern of the lugs to the shape of his self-designed combination last. You can see the Parkhurst logo, which is not a bad thing for marketing. And in this case, you can see that the familiar commando lugs uh, start a little bit inboard and they're actually quite low profile. This means that the lugs are not really visible from the side at the angle other people are looking at your feet on. The uh, heel is made up of veg tanned leather stacks topped with the rubber lug top lift. Andrew used to finish the heels off himself in his Buffalo, New York warehouse, but I'm not sure if he still does that. The midsole is also veg tanned leather, theoretically the best material for midsoles because of the way it toughens uh, the leather, the veg tanning that is. And it is a double sole, uh, double layer midsole, which makes it very firm. And I'll talk about that when I talk about comfort later. Inside the boot, between the midsole and the insole, uh, in this area here under the arch, is inserted a steel shank. A shank is a thin piece of hard material that bridges this gap and it provides arch support as well as torsional stability. The construction method of joining the sole to the uppers is called stitch down. If you want to see what's good your welted construction, take a look at this video. In stitch down, the uppers leather is pulled over the last or lasted to form the shape of the uppers and then the edges are flared out rather than tucked in. The flared out edges are then glued and stitched onto the midsole. In this boot, it's a double row stitch down. 
And in this case, one row of the stitches goes only through to the uh, uppers and the midsole, and the other stitch goes through both, and then also finally through to the outsole. Now, people worry about the exposed stitches being worn away, but the stitching is a lock stitch where the uh, threads sort of crisscross inside. And the glues used these days are pretty incredible. The stitching, as you can see, is really neat and even. Uh, at the back, in the heel area, the uppers are tucked in, and the back of the boot is then glued and stitched inside, and there is a lot of nails used as well. So, um, despite the absence of visible stitching, it shouldn't be going any, anywhere anytime soon. The theory about stitch down construction is that it is, arguably, the most water resistant form of construction because the moisture should just roll off the flared uppers. I've heard from cobblers that resoling is easy, but it could take longer. What they do is they cut off the, the stitches and peel off the old outsole. They glue on a new one and then quite easily stitch through the midsole, but need to take care if you, if you want their stitches to exactly match the holes in the previous stitching. Now, Andrew says he's always been amused by people looking for a really high stitch density per inch because the higher the SPI, the harder it is to match the new stitches to the old holes. Okay, moving on up. Inside the boot is another slab of veg tan used as the insole. Uh, I'll put a Parker's diagram of the construction in here at this point so that you can navigate through the layers. So what we have so far, rubber outsole, two layers of uh, leather midsole on the inside, leather insole. Above the leather insole, uh, just from heel to about midway in the arch, I don't know if you can see it, I'll just put it in the light, there's a leather comfort sock liner with a little rubber pad to protect you from the nail heads and also provide a little squish at the, at the point of the heel. The uppers, I've already talked about the leather used, but I haven't mentioned it's about two mils thick and firm. The uppers are lined with a soft, uh, thin veg tan leather in the vamp area, but it is unlined in the shaft and in the tongue. And that's where you can see the kind of normal suede side and also feel that it's actually quite oily and waxy from the tannage. The uh, edges of the collar and the lace facings, they're cut rather than rolled as befits a uh, ruggedly built boot. The stitching on the uppers is very clean and consistent, probably the most clean and consistent out of all Parkhurst factories, including the old Batavia New York factory that closed down. Uh, the tongue is semi-gusted up to the last eyelet and the antique brass hardware is securely fastened with washer backings. Now these are really nicely inserted because you can't feel any rough scratchy edges when you uh, run your finger over them. The heel counter is veg tanned leather, but I think the toe puff is still uh, celastic. These came with leather laces. Uh, I, I don't actually remember now, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they don't come with a second pair, which is unusual for Parkhurst. In terms of leather care, uh, the Parker's website says that you can use any boot wax or cream, but does have a specific recommendation for Big Four or Smith's Leather Balm. Conditioning it out of the box can darken the leather and, in my experience, can also flatten the look of any rambler, mohawk, uh, kudu or moose, uh, making the variations and striations flatten to a kind of uniform look. My advice with these leathers is to trust in the tannage and allow the tanned in waxes and oils to continue working in the leather. Now in the old days, I used to hear about uh, how you need to condition your boots as soon as you get them because you don't know how long the hide was hanging in the tannery uh, and then hanging in the factory. Uh, and once made, you don't know how long the boots were in the box, in the warehouse, and then at the back of the retailer. All that time in air conditioning could really dry out the leather. But in my opinion, especially with small batch manufacturers, that's just not true anymore, especially post-COVID when materials are so hard to get in scale and keep in stock. There is no stockpiling happening anymore, I don't think. In my opinion, I wouldn't condition these Rambler boots for a long time unless I actually did track them through mud and sand and then dried them out. If I did do that, I'd probably use Big Four very sparingly, and then once dry, I'd hit them gently with a hair dryer or a heat gun to allow the leather to soak the conditioner in and hopefully reveal the variations and matte look on the surface again. 
As for sizing, fit and comfort, I take the 618 last in the same size as the large majority of my American Heritage style boots. I size US 8.5 and, and average D width on the Brannock device and in the huge majority of brands I wear an 8D. Now that's a UK 7.5 true to size. I found the old 602 last really comfy but I did find the modified 602M a little less snug. This 618 last is the perfect combination. The fit is snug in the heel and in the waist, really locking in uh, your heel area. Uh, under the arch, you feel the turning in of the uppers just there, creating like a, like a cantilever-like arch support digging in. Uh, then the boot opens up from there onto the ball of the foot, so that uh, that becomes a, a very comfortable nearly double E width, uh, and so there's no squeezing of any of the bones there. From there, the length, in my opinion, is a teeny bit longer than a 602, allowing the toe box to narrow delicately into the pointed almond uh, toe shape. It is comfortable. Your toes are not squeezed in at all. Trust me, all those people who are scared of pointy toes, <laughs> trust me, they don't. Now, full disclosure, I bought these in June, I think, but in the last four months, I haven't had these on much, hence the sticker. Um, too many boots. <laughs> They're not really broken in because I haven't been able to apply my two weeks every day, then two weeks every other day principle of breaking them in. So right now, they are stiff in the midsole. Um, I haven't bent them back and forth in daily wear enough. You can see that the vamp is only just beginning to show rolls. Uh, the collar is stiff and does dig into my ankles a little bit still. You can see that the shaft is hardly collapsed and rolled. So the upshot is that these are still not like a glove comfy, but due to the last and the construction, there's hardly any rubbing of the heel and tightness in the forefoot. And I can feel that they will wear into my feet rather than the other way around. I'll let you know in the future. As to value, I am biased. Andrew has become a friend and I love the aesthetic and comfort of his brand. I love service boots and Parkers make them in the designs I prefer to others. So Affinity declared these cost 600 Australian dollars and in the US 398 US dollars. And I declare they are at the right price to value ratio. In Australia with added postage, it is a little ex bit expensive. Uh, but what are you comparing against? Australia just doesn't make boots like these. And if you try to compare with handmade boots like Woodens in Victoria, they're about a thousand dollars and deservingly so. Uh, RM Williams is factory made and compare at the same price roughly. In the US though, the price comparison at that price point uh, in the traditional brands uh, like Red Wing and Wolverine. To me, these look better and are better made. In the small batch market, Oak Street Bootmakers is more expensive and you know their quality can be inconsistent. Truman are about par in both price and quality. Grant Stone are in the ballpark. Overall, they are priced, I think, in the right market for sure. It's how you like that $1,000 Viberg look versus the mid $300 Parkhurst price. And that about sums it up. If you like the look, the construction and quality will not let you down. Unless your feet are on the uh, shoulders of the bell curve, the fit and comfort will be good. I like them. Okay, so don't forget to click on like and subscribe. Go hit those buttons and keep up with my videos coming up, including another Parker's model, this time in Horween's brown waxed flesh coming up soon. Until then guys, stay safe out there and see you again soon.